Let's start with, I guess, sort of chronologically. Let's go back to to the weekend. And you heard Drew Brees there say it's the reason he came back was to win a Super Bowl. You've covered Brees his time there in New Orleans. So what struck you about listening to Brees uh, here in advance of this preseason camp? Well, I think overall, first off, he met uh, with the uh, the controversy head on opening up uh, with the conference call with the statement uh, about what happened, uh, explained his position, explained what he was going to going to do go, going forward, and then obviously as the uh, conference call went through, uh, he kind of delved into a lot of different topics. A, just how much he thought about the decision to return for his 15th season in New Orleans, and B. Uh, the fact that, quite frankly, it is a Super Bowl of bust year. Uh, and it's been that way for a while now here uh, for the last couple of seasons. I think we all know that, all understand that. But for a guy that's 41 years old going into his 20th NFL season, 15 here in New Orleans, I think uh, it, the tone is there. Uh, and you kind of picked up on that, not just from him, but Teron Armstead, Michael Thomas, Sean Payton. There is a no-nonsense vibe right now, uh, A, given the fact that these are unprecedented circumstances and uh, it's just not regular uh, uh, things to deal with right now, obviously, with COVID-19. But, B, this is a group that's been around a lot, uh, each other a lot. They've won a lot of football games, and it's time. It is time to finish the job. Sean, what about how Breeze spent his off season in very unorthodox times? What did you make of that? Well, I, I thought, you know, when he brought up the deep ball issue, I thought that was a little bit of self-awareness from him because, you know, we have been, we've been asking Breeze about, you know, deep ball, taking shots, that sort of thing, arm strength for the last few years. And he had never really uh, broke down kind of, uh, I guess, the science of him trying to, you know, I guess, get stronger when it came to uh, deep passes. He was talking about, you know, from being able to throw 60-yard passes. I thought it was a... Uh, a bit of a self-awareness that, hey, I'm 41 years old, and though he, because he's never really come out and said, you know, physically, I'm, uh, you know, I, I can't do what I used to do. But it was sort of a, a sense of a self-awareness that uh, perhaps that's a part of his game he can still improve on. Um, and he's got players uh, this year that can certainly get deep by Buddy Manuel Sanders. Uh, so I do think it was sort of his way of saying that he had to tweak some things. It was very unorthodox, but it threw that sort of no, you know, nothing normal. He was able to discover a few things, and hopefully if the deep ball is a little bit better in 2020, then obviously the great things are the same. Sean Fazan's with us on Twitter at Sean Fazan, Fox 8, Fox 8 New Orleans, been a longtime friend of the show. Um, we also heard from Mike Thomas, who said, who said he could break his record again. It won't take 17 years. He said he could break it again this year. What's your feeling on, on that and sort of what Mike Thomas does for an encore? Uh, well, I don't know if he's going to break the record again. I do know he is, without question, the most motivated, one of the most motivated athletes I've ever been around. Um, just the, the things that he uses to get himself going. You know, uh, I believe Cam Jordan said uh, he finds the smoke everywhere, even if it's fake smoke from, from you know, outside critics or detractors. So um, certainly breaking his own record is uh, motivation enough. Uh, but the thing with Mike Thomas is, you know, it's not like he's going out there getting empty stats. I mean, they needed every bit of that last year to, to have success. So uh, so if he's going to try to re-break that record or break that record again, obviously the Saints would be – the Saints would benefit just because if he's putting up those numbers, the Saints are probably going to be successful. So it doesn't shock me that he has that mentality, that mindset. And, look, I wouldn't doubt him. Uh, it's going to be hard, but I wouldn't necessarily doubt him. I think if anyone can do it, it's certainly him. You know what's interesting, though, Sean, with one more Mike Thomas is – he did that last year, obviously, without a legitimate number two, right? I mean, he was mm-hmm. he was the focus of everybody's defense, and he still put up those numbers. Now that it appears he has help, right, with Emmanuel Sanders, and then they've obviously added talent at tight end, they, would we expect fewer tar- – like, I guess there's two ways to look at it, right? Either mm-hmm. he'll get fewer targets because there's other weapons, or it's going to take it to all the attention away from Thomas and open him up more. Like, how do you see that going this year? Well, I think it flows game to game. I really do, because um, there's only so many, so many things you can take away if you're a defense with double coverage. Uh, and he got a ton of that last year, and still put up those numbers, like you said. I think a lot of that had to do with Eddie, his route running ability and his productivity, but also just the the genius creativity of Sean Payton, just putting him in different spots uh, at different times, in different places, uh, in different formations, all over the field last year to get that to be that that much of the center of attention of other defenses and. 
still have that kind of production. Uh, so it might flow game to game. Some games, maybe they try to take him away more, and if they do that, then Emmanuel Sanders and Jared Cook can hopefully blow up. But if they try to move the coverage elsewhere, it'll be more uh, even, if you will, with their distribution of, of coverages, then perhaps he benefits more. But I do think adding Emmanuel Sanders adds that explosive element. So I think Michael Thomas, in the end, is going to get his touches. He's going to get a lot of uh, yards, receptions, and touchdowns, whether or not he breaks the record. But as long as they're winning, obviously it's irrelevant. But I do think he's going to give ample opportunities to at least come close to that record in 2020. A couple more for you, Sean. Um, speaking of Sean Payton, um, look, like Breeze, you've covered Payton for a long time. And he seems, just listening to him, right, miffed, upset, frustrated. Like, there's a lot of different you know adjectives we can use here. What's your read on what Sean Payton is, is saying about, about this offseason right now? Uh, nothing is normal. It wasn't him that came up with the idea. Uh, it's not training camp. I think he said that four different times in right. the conference call. Look, when he's upset, he lets you know. And he wanted to make sure he got those points across uh, that this was not the same schedule. This is the NFLPA and Management Council. I, I think, obviously, the tone was, A, this is not a, a normal set of circumstances. But I also kind of felt like he was really setting the tone with his players that, A, there is no nonsense here. This is – it is time to work. Uh, there's too many you know, outside influences. There's too many irregularities here uh, for me to deal with anything else. Uh, it's time to get better as a team. It's time to get, you know, get better – as a football play, as football players, or as a football team, and you know he challenges guys to be in shape. Uh, he said there's going to be a lot of running, a lot of lifting. Every bit of the padded practices will be used. Which is something that I don't think has been done uh, in years past, at least in the last few years that I've covered the training camp. So um, he sounded like a guy that's ready to get going, despite the you're right, you know, despite the the new normal, if you will, of COVID nineteen. What's the schedule going to be like for for this team, Sean, over the next month or so? Yeah, well, right now they've shifted into the conditioning phase. They did all the testing, which, according to Jeff Duncan, they are all negative, all eight players. So they'll do this sort of conditioning, running, lifting, walkthrough, meeting uh, until the 12th. And then the 12th, they can do sort of an OTA-style uh, practice, no pads. And then August 17th, the pads come on. And then once the pads come on, you can do the math there. September 13th will be their first game. August 17th, that's less than three, that's less than four weeks, less than a month. Uh, uh, from when they first put the pads on to when they actually play a meaningful regular season game. That's not a whole lot of time. So it sounds like to me, when those pads come on, Stone Payne's going to crank up the uh, the intensity even more. All right, uh, last thing for you, and this may take a second, but let's go through the cuts. Um, I, they didn't waste any time. First of all, any reaction to that? The fact that they had time to cut down to 80, but just are, are already there? Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I thought they would have taken a little bit more time to at least get these guys in to see what they can do, but apparently they just want to get to uh, the 80 that they can work with and not waste anybody's time. Um, you know, you saw Tommy Lee Lewis, Adrian McGee, obviously the LSU uh, offensive lineman, uh, a couple of names that were cut, Ricky Ortiz, the Atrick, uh Nichols, the DB. So, um Look, they had to get down to 80. They had a couple more weeks to do so. They decided to do it now. Again, kind of goes with the let's get to it. So let's not waste anybody's time here. Let's get to it. Let's get to the guys that we're going to have, uh, let's get to our 80 and, and get moving once we get on the field. And obviously today is some form of uh, getting on the field in terms of conditioning, running, lifting, and whatever they do with this quote-unquote walkthrough session. So, um, But, yeah, they're already down to 80. They're not wasting any time. Uh, you mentioned some familiar names. Obviously, were any of those a, any of those cuts a surprise to you? I, I thought Nichols might have had a chance. Uh, Theatric Nichols, the XFL, uh, could have played outside, could have played inside. Especially when you consider, I still think the biggest vulnerability depth wise on this team is that outside cornerback. And if he could have helped there, um, I, I thought that there was perhaps an opportunity for him uh, to maybe uh, crack the roster that way. Uh, Tommy Lee Lewis was a guy, considering the fact that he was part of one of the most you know, infamous play calls or no calls in NFL history, you know, his coming back kind of flew under the radar a little bit. It really wasn't talked about much when he re-signed with the team uh, this offseason, but they didn't waste his time either. They moved on from him. Uh, look, Adrian McGee was a guy I think was going to be a long shot, was probably going to end up being a practice squad guy at best, uh, depending on how he performed in camp, but obviously that's a name 
uh, we all know. So uh, when a notable name gets cut, obviously it's, it's newsworthy. But for the most part, I think most, most of those guys on that list are long shots to make the roster. He's on Twitter at Sean Fazand Fox 8. Y'all give him a follow. Saints moving toward camp. Uh, at least at least they're on the field doing football-like things. It's, it's coming around. Sean, we appreciate the time as always, man. Thanks. All right, bud. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Please leave your comments. I love to interact. And be sure to hit the red subscribe button below.